I've been wanting to produce a video like this now for quite a while. In fact, when I started this channel about four years ago, I even talked to someone about uh, video production who knows a lot about it and said, you know, should I kind of do some videos uh, initially about the things I've learned, about how I've made so many mistakes in the past and things? And they said, well, no, you shouldn't really, be, you know, kind of brush over that. And But now I've come to a point where I feel like I should tell you at least some of the mistakes I've made that are maybe a bit more uh, miscellaneous because of two reasons. One, you'll probably find it really interesting and kind of entertaining, and if you want to laugh at me, that's absolutely fine. And the second reason is if you are a falconer or you are interested in getting into falconry, you're thinking of getting your own hawk or other bird of prey, it's going to be a really valuable video for you to learn so you don't make the same mistakes. Now, I spent over a year working in a bird of prey center, a little one that doesn't actually exist anymore, it was attached to a theme park, but there I did lots of flying of barn owls, eagle owls, um, harris hawks, and even an African vulture. But I didn't do a lot of cleaning or husbandry work. I wasn't doing coping of beaks or um, making anklets and fitting them and that type of thing. That was all things I learned after being at the centre. And I feel like with a lot of that kind of stuff, you learn lots of real interesting details, nuances and things about birds, do's and don'ts and things that you only really learn when you learn that stuff. If that makes sense. Therefore, I didn't really make any mistakes as such when I worked at the centre. I never lost any birds, I never had any issues of birds not coming down from trees. Now, when it comes to flying birds in the centre, they generally do fly better than mobile shows because the birds live in that place, they are looking at the flying arena all the time, so they're naturally going to fly quite well all the time anyway. And there was an element of that. And also it was managed, I had staff around me and so on. When I started to get my own birds and the very beginnings of Owl Adventures came about in early 2011, that's when some mistakes began. And uh, the first mistake, unfortunately, didn't happen or didn't start in a nice area like this. It happened somewhere a little bit more noisy. So it all started actually here on this street, which is actually quite a reasonably busy road. So I used to live in a house just down here close to 15 years ago. And it was there that I first kept a few birds of prey in the back garden. And I had them tethered on some perches during the day. And I was actually keeping at the time a few birds that I'd borrowed from my boss at the time, from the centre, in between things, just getting my business set up. And a couple of birds that I'd bought myself, including a great grey owl we called Gordon. And in in many ways, this is the first mistake. I bought a one-year-old great grey owl. <sighs> great greys are a beautiful species of owl. And if anyone's selling one of them, there's got to be a reason. There's always a reason why someone's going to sell a bird. For example, if someone's going to have a 20 or 30 bird collection and they're going to sell a few birds, they're not going to sell their best birds. This bird wasn't 100% tame. It was a little bit on edge, a little bit nervous. Typical great grey in some respects. But I thought, hey, I can man it up. I can get it tame enough, hopefully be able to fly it free. Well, I'd set it down on a bow perch in the back garden of a house down here. I'd been out somewhere and a neighbour phoned me and said, I've just seen an owl fly by. And I thought, oh no, that particular owl isn't the tamest in the world. And also it is not at flying weight and it's not even a trained flying bird either. So I came back and it was actually up one of these trees here, which as you can see, not the biggest tallest trees in the world, but they are next to what is quite a busy road. And of course, the worry there is that the bird is going to end up going down to the road and get hit by a car. In fact, I remember some people walking by and we said, we're trying to get the owl down and they're like, oh, really? And they looked up and when they saw the face of the great grey, they were quite mesmerised by it. They were quite impressed, you could say. I wasn't impressed. The bird was looking at me. We tried a bit of food on the glove, tried a bit of food on the floor. It was not interested. Now, I should probably explain what actually happened. I worked out what had happened as soon as I looked at the perch, the bow perch it was on. The equipment I'd put on and the mistake I'd made was I had tethered it correctly, but for some reason the swivel wasn't actually the right size for the knot on the end of the leash. So it looks like it is, but if you pull on it hard enough it comes through. Now the mistake there really was to have a few different birds and rather than making sure they all had the same equipment, I must have kind of inadvertently swap with them around and therefore it obviously uh, looked okay and as the bird tried to fly what we call baiting it's actually managed to get free it's flown past the window and ended up uh, in a, a tree over here now after about half an hour the owl flew out of the tree and went across right over 
to a, a private garden area, which in a way has a bit of an advantage because at least it's away from the busy road. But quite a disadvantage because now he's up a very high tree. Now this was in the middle of June, towards the end of June, so we had lots of daylight in the evening and it was about seven o'clock in the evening when the owl ended up in this private garden. Like I say, relief that it wasn't in the busy road anymore, but now up such a big tree in full leaf. We could just about make the shape of the owl out. We had different people coming and helping, standing over here, standing over there. Now we even tried spooking the bird as well, clapping our hands, shouting and things like that. Would it wake up a bit? Would it move? The idea being that it might move down to a lower branch or the wall or something like that. But unfortunately, it never really happens like that. In fact, if you are falconer watching this to try and get some advice and some ideas, I would highly recommend you never do anything like that because more often than not, the bird will end up just higher up a tree and even less likely to come down, more reluctant. Now, it got dark. <clears throat> it got to about quarter past ten and we got to the point where we can barely see the owl anymore. I did see it move one last time into this direction and we had to just call it a day, essentially, and go home. So I woke up the next morning, very, very early, about half past three, just as it was getting light, came out here and thought, I'm going to try and find the owls on my own. I was walking up and down the paths. This is a, a hotel behind me here, walking along the wall around the edge, up and down. And I actually found a tawny owl at one point. And this tawny owl, and this is the thing about tawny owls, is when I am talking to people on displays and they want to know how could you spot an owl, I say, well, look, probably one of the easiest ways is to walk around some woodland uh, or a path where there are lots of trees in the middle of summer, either very early or in the evening. And the tawny owls, because they've got such little dark to hunt in, they are going to be out and about a bit more in the evening light or the early morning light. And you can just see them sat there just looking at you. But this particular tawny owl was looking at something wasn't looking at me, looking at something in the distance there, and it's every now and again a little chirp at it, a little bark at it, and I thought, ah, and I followed the path of the tawny owl and noticed the great grey sat on a branch. Now, he was a bit lower down. He was probably about 12 foot up. I thought, right, what can I do? So I ran down the hill back home there, two minutes away, and I got hold from the back garden, the pole that holds up the washing line. And I hooked on uh, a little hook, like with gaffer tape, like a coat hanger or something. I found a little metal hook. I then came to the hotel about half five in the morning by this point, And the caretaker who'd seen me bouncing around the place, asked what I was doing, I explained, he offered to help, he found a stepladder. And there was another gentleman staying in the hotel who was up early, he just wanted to come and watch. So the three of us went underneath where the owl was, on this branch, and had the stepladder. I climbed up the stepladder as high as I could underneath it. And with the pole, I could just about reach the bird's equipment. So the furniture, that's the name of the equipment that the bird is wearing. He had his anklets on, of course, he had the jesses and the swivel. So I was trying to hook the swivel if not the swivel, then perhaps where the jesses meet or something like that. It took me about 20, 25 minutes. I'm trying my best. I had to have a break. Couldn't quite do it. And eventually I managed to hook it, pull it. The owl came down. He got free again, but now landed on an even lower branch. Got the set ladder underneath. Now, if I was to just walk up quickly and grab him, he'd probably set off again. So I very carefully stepped up the ladder and got him back. And was so relieved that I managed to get him back. Now it just goes to show that when it comes to a bird that isn't particularly trained, it is possible to retrieve it. I mean, there was a Bengal eagle owl uh, many years ago. Someone rang me and said there's an animal in my back garden. And I went over there, there was this Bengal eagle owl on the floor. It jumped up to a fence. I could see it had nothing on its legs, no anklets, not even an identity ring. And then it flew into the apple tree. I threw some chicks on the floor to see if it would look at them. You know, could we maybe use a lure or something? Didn't seem bothered about the food. So I thought, well, I better pick those chicks up off the floor and went over there and picked them up. And it didn't seem to move at that point. I thought, OK, so I stalked it, technical term, where I essentially walked very, very slowly. And if it looked at me, I just stopped, maybe looked away. And it probably took me about 45 minutes to move what was about 10 feet. And eventually I got myself right in front of the owl. And I remember there was a branch here and I had to kind of go under at one point really, really slowly like that. And eventually I got up and I remember thinking, it's now or never. If I get this wrong, he's gone. So I brought my hands up slowly. And he turned his head at one point and saw me because I'd come up so slowly, he wasn't spooked. And then grabbed him and got him. And we managed to rehome him. Never found the owner. 
uh, but we managed to rehome them with the help of the IBR. And so um, it is possible to do that, but really prevention really is so much better than the cure. So big lesson learned here, it's about checking the furniture. When birds get free with equipment on from a perch, it's either that the knot wasn't done correctly, and even I had a staff member have that issue recently. They were quite new, they made a mistake, the bird hadn't gone far and we got it back, but it can happen even with people who've been trained and they've practiced the knot a number of times. So checking the knot's really important. Maybe doing a double knot, in fact, if you wish. A double falconer's knot for extra security. Or the equipment's wrong. The anklet's slightly too big, uh, the leash isn't right. Usually it's when you change something. It's sometimes it's something's wearing away and it's getting old. Old leather dresses, for example, will snap. So as a rule of thumb, if you're using leather anklets and dresses, especially anklets, because you might use braided dresses instead of leather, at the point where they're starting to not feel so flexible anymore, that's probably the time to replace them. You can use a grease, a renopore is what I use, and that can help give them some life, but don't leave them on too long. That's the, the biggest message I can tell you about this particular mistake. I'm also going to tell you, as a little bonus, another mistake I made that same month with an eagle owl I had. There was a male eagle owl I bought. Now, here's another mistake. He didn't have an A10, an Article 10 form. You need that by law to technically transfer any money. So you can give one away for free, but you're not allowed to pay money for it by law. You need that piece of yellow paperwork. And of course, the guy who sold me the bird said, oh, don't worry, I'll send it in the post. Turns out, when I tried to get in touch with him, his address wasn't working, his number wasn't working anymore. I remember he told me where he worked. It was some kind of water company thing. And I remember where he was roughly, and I managed to find the number and I rang them. I said, did you have a so-and-so work for you? Oh, yes, we used to, and uh, he's actually left, his post has been returned, so I think he's fled the country. So I ended up having to rehome that bird, and we did find a good home for him. It was a great flying bird. He used to fly, not to the glove, but to perch a perch really, really well. Well, the mistake I made with him one day was taking him down to a field, there's a river at the bottom, and I thought, this bird flies really well, I'm going to send him up to the top of that tree. A bit like you would a Harris hawk, perhaps. It is not recommended to do that with a large owl species, actually any owl species for that matter. In fact, don't ever get a bird and think, you know what I'll do, I'll just cast it off and see what happens. You know, because when these owls, especially these large eagle owl type species or any strict genus owls, as soon as they get right up a tree, they can see so much and all of a sudden it's like they're not trained anymore. They're too distracted. There's also an element of, well, you're quite far down, actually, and I'm not used to flying down from this height too much. He was there for quite a long time, and I was really worried he'd be there overnight, a bit like the Great Grey was. I hate the idea of having a bird overnight. You can't sleep. It's just awful. Because, of course, you never know where it might end up going. And this particular owl didn't have any transmitter on all those years back then. This is before GPS. And my mentor at the time, he didn't use any telemetry on anything but a falcon. In fact, he even one day said telemetry is rubbish because he's had a bad experience. And there's me thinking, well, why would I bother putting a transmit on? It's not going to work, I guess. And, you know, that was part of the issue back then. At least now, if I've got a bird up a tree with a transmitter on, I'm not as worried because if it does move, we can track it again. So I did the only thing that I could do in that situation. I chopped the tree down. I actually had some workmen nearby on the road. I said, I haven't got a saw I could borrow. It wasn't a massive oak tree. It was like a little thin thing like this. So I did that and the tree came down the water. The owl got a bit wet, but I ran out and got him back. I don't think I'll ever do that again. <laughs> it's probably one of the wildest things I've ever done in falconry. In fact, if you're still watching at this point in the video, I think you deserve to know that next year I'm going to start writing a book. Not a book, as I would often say. I'm getting better at that. A book. And I'm going to write a book. Um, each chapter is going to be a sort of a different topic, but the, the adventures of our adventures, probably the past 15 years of experiences, training different birds. Uh, there will also be chapters on um, people that I've worked with, good and bad, some of the stories I can tell you about some of the team members of the past, they're just fascinating. And people have said you've got to write a book because the stories you have, like the one about chopping a tree down, I mean, it's just, it's really interesting and people will learn from it. So I'm going to start writing the book. <clears throat> I don't know when I'll have it out. It's not going to be like published. It'll be self-published. Um, we'll definitely create a bit of a tour 
um, so that I'm gonna do a bit of a tour. In other words, call up a big bookshop. Can I come in and like talk about my book and have a little stand? Well, we don't know, you're not an author. All right, can I bring an eagle owl in to show people while I'm there? Pfft, yeah, great, you know, there's that leverage. So really excited, later on next year, hopefully, I'm gonna have a book out. No idea what it'd be called yet, but something that, um, I just really want to do and get on paper all this stuff in my head. So that's one of the um, exciting things happening in 2025, or at least I'll, I'll start writing it in 2025. Um, there are other things as well. Keep an eye on the channel. And the next episode of Falkland Mistakes will be out soon because some of the stories only get wilder, to be quite honest with you. Anyway, I hope you found that really useful. Thanks for watching.